Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. There's always been a burden for me, um, and that is that the church would be strong. And you've heard me say it over and over again, anytime I get a chance to come up, um, that we want the church to not be overcome by what this world has to offer, but we know that there's a lot of things that are coming down the pike. 22, we don't know what it holds, but we have a God that knows. And, um, and so I've always had an extreme interest in getting the church ready for whatever. And um, I didn't know I was going to preach this until um, midweek or so, you know, when Ryan's not feeling well. But um, so... I want to tell you today that God is with us no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're going to go through, no matter what you're facing today, He is with us and He will never leave us or forsake us. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, we're done for the day. We'll see you. All right, I want to take a poll. You know, there are polls all over the place, right? But I want to just uh, see what you think about these questions. So first one is, raise your hands if this applies to you. How many of you are human? You know, I've, I've, said, I've asked that question a lot. I? Uh, how many of you have experienced trouble, hardship, adversity, betrayal, and difficulties at some point in your life? <clears throat> okay. How many of you have been confused, bewildered, discouraged, or in despair due to the circumstances in your life at some point. We want to talk to those that are not raising their hands. How do you do it? How many of you have grumbled, complained, shared your feelings about hardships and adversity at any time in your life? We're, you're, uh, we can grumble and complain, right? But here's the, here's the ultimate question for today. How many of you have considered that God works in you through your hardships, difficulties, adversity, and troubles? Amen? God has the ability to do that. You see, the reality is, folks, in our world today, we will have adversity and trouble in this life. If you're trying to run from it, stop running. Face it. Whatever it is that we are going through. And there is a lot that people are going through these days. There's a lot that our world is going through. There's a lot that our country is going through. There's a lot that our families are going through and individuals are going through. And it is true that we generally don't do adversity well. It just doesn't make us happy, right? It disrupts our plans, Goals, dreams, emotions, etc. Every part of our life seems to be turned upside down sometimes. And it confuses us when we have such a great God who can protect us from these troubles. Why doesn't he protect me? Why doesn't he continue to strengthen me? Sometimes we don't feel that. We are, sometimes we are not designed. Folks, I, I got to tell you this. It's something I've said over and over again, and I will preach it. You can put it on my tombstone. We are not designed to be in this world of trouble. This is not God's design. I believe what Larry Crabb said one time when he said, you know, when God looks down upon us and we struggle, he really is saying, this is not the plan for my people. And so when you look at Genesis to Revelation, he's been trying to get us to an eternal home. And when we put our stock on this and we, we depend on what this life has to offer, we're going to fail and get discouraged. This is not God's original design, but God. What Pastor Kuhn said, right? But God. Here's the reality. While we have adversity, adversity has a function, a purpose, a greater work within us. And that's what we want to talk about today. But the wild card in all of this, you know, plug your ears because you're not going to like this. The wild card in all of this is our attitude. It's how we see life. You see, we don't have to like it, but we do, but 
do we grumble and complain through it, or do we allow God to help us grow through it? So the title of the message today is Grumble or Grow? When we go through things, are we ready to grow in the Lord, or are we ready to grumble and be defeated and be in despair and be discouraged and allow the enemy to take over instead of finding the perfect God that wants to help you through any circumstance that you can go through today? And any circumstance for tomorrow. So I want to look at James 1. I, I, I really believe there's a great conspiracy in Scripture between James and Paul to, uh, to teach us this particular concept. But in James 1, verses 2 to 4, it's one of my favorite verses, because I deal with a lot of discouragement and deal with a lot of what people that are just struggling through a lot of adversity. But it says this in, in verse 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. <laughs> you got to be kidding me, Lord. I need to make an appointment with God because he's got this backwards. When trouble of any kind comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when you, your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Wow. Did you know that when you go through something, we can have the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, and we can get through it. In fact, the purpose of it is to strengthen us to endure endurance that brings us complete maturity in him. Now, the word joy, I looked it up. The word joy there in that verse uh, 2 is to rejoice, rejoicing. It is closely related to gladness and happiness, although joy is more a state of being. Get this, folks. It is more a state of being than an emotion, a result of choice. What is fascinating to me is when I'm going through a trial, I am not happy about it. How about you? When you're going through something, and that's not what the Bible is saying. It's not saying you should be happy about everything that goes through, but the word joy implies something deeper than just an emotion. It is a state of mind. It is a state of being. It is the ability to be able to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that no matter what you go through, God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you, and his strength can become your strength and your weakness. God is here. And no matter what we're going to face this year, no matter what we're going to face in the future, the enemy is not stronger than God. God is the one that saves. He is the one that brings victory to us. Amen? There was a quote somebody had said in the Bible expository commentary when I was studying this particular verse. And I thought it was pretty profound. He said this, outlook determines outcome. So in other words, our attitude, we can either grumble through something with the attitude or we can have an attitude that I want to grow through it. I don't want it to defeat me. And he says this, attitude determines action. So outlook determines outcome and attitude determines action. Because the Bible says, consider it pure joy in one translation. Consider it an opportunity for great joy in the New Living Translation. Now, the word consider, when I looked up that word, it means to evaluate. To evaluate. So when you are going through something, it says here, evaluate it as an opportunity for great joy because great joy will bring endurance. When you can really hold on to the Lord in everything that you are going through, and he said, when we face the trials of life, we must evaluate them in the light of what God is doing for us. One other thing he said was this, which I think was really powerful. Our values determine our evaluation. <laughs> so when you evaluate something, your values come into play. It's what you believe. It's, it's, it's how you want 
to let your mind go. It's like, okay, I can, I can look at it from my perspective, which a lot of times, I don't know if you know this, it's, it's pretty dark sometimes, right? Or I can look at it from God's perspective and his word that can encourage us, that can bring us victory every situation. Well, I'm going to read a quote here. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to read a quote that um, kind of nails it, and it hurts. All right? He said this, If we value comfort more than character, these trials will upset us. If we value the material and the physical more than the spiritual, we will not count it all joy. And if we live only for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us bitter and not better. Wow. He goes on to say, so when trials come, immediately give thanks to the Lord and adopt a joyful attitude. Look at trials through the eyes of faith, not through the eyes of what we're going through. This is hard, isn't it? Amen. It is hard. Because what we're doing, what we're really, the reality of what we're looking at here is the fact that adversity is going to hit us. We are all enrolled in Adversity University. You are all taking classes. You just don't know it. You haven't checked to see what your report card says. Have you succeeded through it or have you failed? Do you give in to the discouragement and despair of what you're going through? Or do you come out victorious because you know our God is bigger than any circumstance. He's bigger than anything that is going to happen to you, whether it be personal, in your family, in our community, in our country, and in our world. God loves us all. Outlook determines, outlook determines outcome. So what this person's suggestion is to end with joy, you need to begin with joy. In other words, take your relationship with the Lord. Begin to cultivate it. Know who God is when it is sunny. So that when you know, you will know who God is when it's raining. You, you determine who God is in your life when things are going right. So that when things go wrong, you hold on to the foundation that you have in him. But that means that we have to develop that relationship. Isn't it it funny? Most of the times, and and I do that too, I found myself caught up in that. It's like every time a trouble happens, I'm calling on the Lord. And and he's like, well, where have you been the rest of the time? And, And then another thing that usually happens is that we tend to complain, where were you, Lord? Look at what's happening to me. Where were you? And God's like, I'm right here. I've always been here. I knew this was going to happen, and I wanted to strengthen you before. So God is calling us to be prepared. The word endurance means patience, perseverance. And I love this word. It's constancy. Constancy under suffering in faith. In other words, the precept of constancy towards God It's like when endurance comes, you know beyond any shadow of a doubt. You know that you know that you know God exists and he is with you through the trial. And sometimes, a lot of times though, when we're not mature enough in our spirituality, we tend to waver in that. Now this quote here is pretty powerful. He says, spiritually immature people are always impatient. Mature people, spiritually, are patient and persistent. We are able to hold on. Folks, it does not make me happy what I'm going through, but I know I have the joy of the Lord, which is my strength. And I have to rely on the joy of the Lord, not on what I see. Going through difficulties, trusting God and obeying Him results in patience and character. Knowing this, we can face trials joyfully. So I want to go to... to, uh, Paul's writing in Romans, in Romans chapter 5, the first four verses, and it kind of mimics a little bit of what James was talking about. It says this, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Folks, I want you to just absorb that one phrase. 
We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. We don't have peace because of what we've done. We have peace because of what God has done. And all we need to do is accept what God has done so that we can have greater peace in our lives. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. But here's the glitch. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop what? Endurance. And endurance develops character, strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Folks, do you know that this is kind of a perfect cycle? I mean, look at that. We go through trials. It develops endurance. The endurance that we face develops our character, and our character provides the hope for the next trial. It's like God is rotating within us a growth program. We don't want to enroll in that, of course, but we have to because God wants us to be stronger. He doesn't want us to be status quo. He does not want us to stay where we are. He wants to grow. He wants us to grow in Him. He wants us to grow in strength. He wants us to grow in joy of the Lord, which is our strength, so that we can face anything that comes our way. Jesus said it too. I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. <laughs> it's like Jesus is saying, you know, you're going to go through a lot of things, and a lot of things are going to happen in this world, but I've told you these things so that you may have peace in me, not in the world, in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. Peter says it too. In 1 Peter 1, 6-7, it says, so, truly, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. <laughs> mere gold. Your faith is more precious than mere gold. And what we hold on to is we hold on to gold because it's pretty valuable. It must be our faith is a much more valuable than anything that we could have on this earth. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Amen? So I want to I wanna talk about three lessons that we can learn about adversity. Three lessons from three biblical giants. And the first lesson is this, and this is what we can learn through adversity. Number one, we need to endeavor to focus on the bigger picture. When you are going through something, we need to focus on the bigger picture. And you say, well, what in the world is the bigger picture? My tire is flat. My bank account is zero. I have lost a loved one. I've had tragedy happen in my life. I've had COVID. I've got comorbid situations that are making COVID a lot more worse than it should be. How do I look at the bigger picture? Well, the bigger picture isn't in what you see. The bigger picture is in God and what he wants to do in your life. Look at Joseph. Joseph is the giant that I want us to talk about. Remember, he was sold into slavery betrayed by his family. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison because he did a righteous thing. And he was betrayed by the chief cupbearer and who forgot Joseph after getting out of prison. For 13 years, as you know, it's 13 years from the time he was sold by his brothers to the time he was second in command in Egypt. 13 years! How many of us can't wait 13 minutes? <laughs> and I'm ready to get out! I want out of this trial. Yet he spent years in prison for doing nothing wrong. 
Jesus was crucified for doing nothing wrong. And yet in the midst of his pain, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. See, Jesus didn't focus on what was happening. He focused on his father because he knew beyond any shadow of a doubt where his future lied. It is with his father and eternity for the rest of eternity. You know, that's a long time, by the way. Don't focus so much on what we have in this world. Focus on God who gives us everything and all the strength that we need. And so he was able to say this in Genesis 45 to his brothers. He says, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for setting, uh, selling me here because it was to save many lives that God sent me ahead of you. He saw the bigger picture. Now, did Joseph see the bigger picture right away? I don't think so. Because I don't think when he was in prison and betrayed, you know, he all of a sudden said, God, I know you have something else here. Now, there is a grounded faith that can help that, but I don't care. I don't care how strong you are. You may be the strongest person in this room in faith, but there's still going to be things that will confuse you. There's still going to be things, and I'm going to demonstrate that in the next lesson, okay? Genesis 50 says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You never know what you're going through can turn into something that God wants it to turn into. You know, sometimes we can't see where God has taken us but by hindsight. We can't see where we're going. God didn't take the Israelites and say, here, follow me. Here's the GPS. It will tell you how long it's going to take and how many miles you're going to have to travel. He said, follow me. He said to his disciples, This is what I want you to do. Just follow me. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worries of its own. (laughs) Jesus said this. And it's got to frustrate the disciples because it's like, but we don't know where we're going. And when we don't know where we're going, we grumble and complain. But God is there and he says, I've got your back. I will take you through. And every single time he succeeded in bringing us through, bringing them through. Amen? Amen. So let's look at lesson number two. Keep your eyes focused on God through any circumstance. We have to learn to focus on God through any circumstance. And all we have to do is look at Job. How many have read the book of Job? You can get a little discouraged sometimes, right? With what Job had to go through. He was a righteous man. He would sacrifice for his children just in case they may have sinned. So he lived in a foundation, and that is so important with what I'm going to say. He lived in the foundation of God. He developed his relationship before all his trials ever hit. But he was talking to somebody, and a servant came and said his animals were stolen and his farmhands were killed. The next servant came, his sheep, and all the shepherds were lost. Then his camels were stolen and his servants were killed. And then he lost all of his children. Can you imagine facing that? He lost every one of his children. Here's how we responded in Job 1. At this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. OMG. You got to be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. You've just lost everything, including your own children, and you're still praising the Lord. You know, his wife was a really good one. Well, just curse God and die. But here is the good news about Job is that he had a foundation with his God. And he built that foundation. But even after he said this, folks, after he said this, he lost all his health. I mean, everything. He lost everything. And he had had three wonderful friends. 
And if you've ever seen the discourse, it usually is a conversation between him and his wonderful friends. So let me just depress you for a minute, okay? I want to just outline a few things that Job said, and I'll bet you it's things that we've said about our own trials. It says, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, may, may the day of my birth perish, and the night it was said, a boy is born. That day, may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine upon it. He said, if only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. No wonder my words have been impetuous. He said, what strength do I have that I should still hope? What prospects that I should be patient? He said, therefore, I will keep silent. I will, I will not keep silent, and I will speak out in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. See, there's one thing that really impressed me about Job. When his friends kept trying to explain why he was going through, he says, I'm sorry. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I can free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. He was not happy about what he was going through. He hated what he was going through. He hated his life. And his friends are like, hey, oh, you got to have faith in the Lord. You must have done something wrong. Why are you talking about God like this? Has anybody ever felt that, that strong? I despise my life. I would, not, I would not live forever. Let me alone. My days have no meaning. I like this one. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression and smile, I still dread all my sufferings. <laughs> it's like, as you ever had, hey, hopefully you don't have friends like this, but if you have friends, well, just have happiness, just the joy, okay? Just smile. Let it catch up to you. See, the problem is, you can fake it, but you still dread your sufferings, Right? Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before any eye saw me. If only I had never come and in, came into being or had carried straight, or carried straight from the womb to the grave. My eyes have grown dim with grief. My whole frame is but a shadow. Yet I am silenced by the darkness, by the thick darkness that once covered my face. And finally, the churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. Has anybody been there? But here is the crux of what we're talking about. He felt all of these things. And yet in Job 13, 15, he uttered these words. Even though you slay me, Yet will I trust you. Even though you slay me, yet I will put my hope in you. He responded to the Lord. His friends were lousy friends. But God did not charge him with wrongdoing. And he knew beyond every suffering that he was going through, he knew who his God was. And I wonder if we can do that for ourselves today, that we can prepare so much of our spiritual lives so that when something happens, I can say, life stinks, I don't like it, I wish I wasn't born. If I change my expression and smile, I still dread what I'm going through. But the one thing that I'm not going to do is I'm not going to abandon my God because I know he has a solution. I don't know when that's going to come, but when it comes, I will be praising him. Because I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we can praise the Lord in our sufferings and in our trials. I want you to try that. Somebody cut you off in traffic. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you get a flat tire. Something else happens in a friendship or in your life. I dare you. I double dare you to praise the Lord. Can you imagine if that came from the depth of your soul? The trial stinks. It is not God's design. 
But you can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, my God is still here. My God is still alive. My God still loves me. My God gives me strength. All right, lesson number three. Because we're getting ready to end. Lesson number three. We need to un- endeavor to understand the greater purpose. I know this is kind of difficult, but the, the, God has a greater purpose, you know? And it, it's what I've said earlier that, that we can't see God sometimes but through hindsight. We look at where we've come from and we say, God is good. Every one of us can do that. We can look back and say, you know, I came from misery, but I see where God is directing me. Okay, I hear, I hear somebody saying something different. Listen to me carefully. Because I'm being prompted to, to say something. Yes, there are people, and I, and I deal with a lot of hurt, that have been through an awful lot. And it doesn't seem like I can turn the corner any day. It seems like every time, every person, it seems like everything defeats me. What's the purpose in that? Do you remember when Psalm 73, the writer was saying, you know, I know that, Lord, I'm envious because I see the prosperity of the wicked. How many have ever said that? You know, it's like, I don't understand why those that don't know the Lord just seem to get everything. And I'm living a life of Christianity, and and I have the Lord in my life, and I have nothing but hardship. Ever since I accepted the Lord, I've had trouble. (laughs) And and listen to what the psalmist said in one of the verses. It says, when I tried to understand all this, it became oppressive to me. (laughs) It's like, when I tried to understand all of what I'm seeing, it became oppressive. Until I entered the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their final destiny. You see, when you're, when you're going through that much trial, when you've had that much happen to you in your life, and you're, stri- you're still trying to heal, and you're stri- still trying to bring yourself through it, Psalm 34 says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And so when you face troubles, and you face a broken heart, you can know beyond any shadow of a doubt, even though you don't see him, and even though you don't feel him, he is working. He is working. And you keep hanging on, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going to go through, you just carry your umbrella because the storms will come, but your God is what brings us through. Don't turn your back on Him. And that's about attitude, isn't it? Because when I've had defeat after defeat after defeat, yeah, my attitude stinks. I don't know who God is. Who in the world is he? He just punishes me. Even though he slay me, yet will I trust you. Amen. Paul, in understanding the greater purpose, Paul faced many difficulties in his ministry, if you ever read a lot of his writings. But he is the one who wrote this in 2 Corinthians 4. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. You know what he's saying? Hey, we have, we're hard-pressed, we're perplexed, we're persecuted, we're struck down, but guess what? We're not crushed, we're not in despair, we're not abandoned, and we're not destroyed. We can do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can go through anything because my God will be with me. And you just have to keep perfecting that. So he says this, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, What is unseen is eternal. He said that. He realized, folks, I don't want to focus on what I can see because what I can see, it stinks. But I focus on what God, what God is through that. Amen? But what I want to point out here is 2 Corinthians 12 because here's a time of the great paradox. It's like, I, you know... 
How many think weakness is bad? You know? I've talked to people sometimes. It's like, when I'm weak, I just feel weak. I feel bad. You know, it's just not good. It's not good. It's not good. I don't want weakness. I'm trying to pretend like I'm strong. But here's what Paul said. He had a thorn in the flesh. And he said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So you might be going through something and you're saying, I cannot hold up under it. Guess what? God's power can be manifested in any weakness you have. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am am strong. That's weird. That does not make sense, folks. But how many times does God not make sense? Because it's based on faith. He comes through, not in our understanding. Do you know why God said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean what? Not on your own understanding. When you try to figure it out, it becomes oppressive. When you trust in the Lord, He will give us power and He will perfect our weaknesses and He will bring us through any circumstance that we can face. Amen? Are you excited? I'm excited for the Lord. But He ran toward His weakness. He said he would boast. It's almost like he embraced it. This guy is not right. What are you talking about? Can you imagine us doing that? Taking our weakness and embracing it because you knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that God can give you power through it. That you're not going to stay weak. You are not defined by your weakness. You're not defined by what you've been through. You're not defined by what other people have said about you. You're not defined by what you think about yourself. You are defined by the living God of this universe who loves you and will never leave you or forsake you. I'm just excited about that. So I just want to conclude with three takeaways. As we kind of close the message here today, three things I want to wrap up with. We've talked about. Number one, adversity leads to growth. You got to grasp that. Anything you face can be the pathway to grow in the Lord. Let's stop being defeated by our own despair, by our own attitude, by our own grumbling about it. Let's look up and let's see what God wants to do through it. God's strength plus our endurance plus our attitude about our circumstances can be the breeding ground for growth because I'm changing how I view what I'm going through. It won't work if we give in to grumbling, despair, discouragement, fear, etc. God said so many times, do not be afraid or discouraged. He said to Jehoshaphat, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. He wants to bring us through. To be stretched is to grow and mature as a believer. Second takeaway, no matter what we face, God is always with us and working in us. Always. Don't focus on what you feel about it. No, beyond any doubt whatsoever, God is with you in the trial. We are not alone. We may not have a lot of people around us, but I guarantee you the God of the universe is there with you. And he can give us a different perspective of things. Because his power is made perfect in our weakness. We may not know why something is happening, or we may not know the outcome, but God always comes through for our benefit. We, you know, do you know know what Ephesians, uh, um, what is it? 3.20 says, 
For he is able to do immeasurably more than what we could ever ask or imagine. Anything you think you want from God, he is there to do even greater work than that. You can't even imagine what God has in store for us. He has placed eternity in our hearts. There is a drive to want to have something greater and better. And it's God that provides it. Don't give in to the discouragement. Finally, number three, adversity. And I don't like this either, by the way. Adversity can purge us of what is in us. <laughs> I've got to tell you something. If you want to know what's in you, go through a trial. <laughs> You'll find out what you think. You'll find out how you act. You'll find out what you feel. You'll find out your attitude towards people. All of that will come out. It's because God loves us so much. And he knows what's in us that keeps us from him. And so he squeezes us. He will allow circumstances to squeeze us. And oh, by the way, I got to share this too. Husbands and wives, he even uses your spouse to squeeze you. Because sometimes we blame our spouse. You did this. You caused this to happen. <laughs> what, if we, what if something happened and we just looked up at the Lord and said, praise the Lord, because now I know what's coming on and he needs to be healed. Wow, there's an anger inside that does not belong in this marriage. What if God healed it because it was exposed by your spouse or by circumstances or by a friend or by a coworker, or by a boss or by what's happening in our country today? Oh, my goodness. Folks, many things can, can sabotage us from victory. Our thoughts, our emotions, our experiences, our attitudes, and our beliefs. But God wants to expose them, not so he can ridicule us. It's so he can heal us. And he only heals us because he wants a deeper relationship with us. God is not malicious in what he does. He knows what he is doing. The only question is, do I stay on the surgical table long enough for him to do it? And sometimes the circumstances of our life is the scalpel that God uses to do the surgery. So folks, let's stand together. No matter what is happening in your individual life, no matter what is going to happen tomorrow, no matter what is happening in your family, you may have suffered a loss, you may have had things that are happening, you may have had financial issues. It doesn't matter. There is something that is happening in your life. There is things that are happening in our community. There are things that are happening in our country. There are things that are happening in the world. You know, I watch the news. How many of you watch the news? How many of you need therapy after you watch the news? But here's the way I look at it. Because I believe that God will never leave us and he is here all the time. I watch the news from the lens of the end times. And I can see what's happening in our world. I can see what's going to happen in 2022. And all I can do is praise the Lord. And I wish each one of you could do that too. The next time something happens in our country, the next time whatever happens comes, whatever COVID, I don't care, whatever variant is going to come down the pike because there is no variant that's greater than God. Yeah. Amen? There is nothing we're going to face. And yes, we do have issues physically, and, and COVID is attacking it. But Lord, but, you know, we've got to deal with the underlying issues. And it's almost as if the circumstances is the COVID to our original condition. Because COVID attacks what we already have. It's already the physical stuff that we have going on. And they're finding out more and more that people are not dying of COVID. They're dying of whatever it is COVID has exacerbated. They're starting to figure it out. So it's the underlying condition 
That is the problem. And I'm saying spiritually, it's the underlying condition that keeps us discouraged. It isn't what happens to us. It isn't adversity that attacks us. It's already the condition of the heart. And I pray that every heart in this room would strengthen itself. Steal yourself against what is coming this year. We can guarantee it. Jesus said there are going to be many things that are going to happen. Many trials are going to happen. Timothy said it too. In the last days, there will be wonderful times. No, no. There will be terrible times. But Jesus is the answer. Amen? Let's go with the strength of knowing that whatever I face, whatever I face, he's got our back. It may not look like it, but he's there. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we're just thankful for this time here today. And we ran a little long, but Lord, you're trying to create an excitement internally in each one of us, not just in a corporate way where the church needs to be strengthened to, to survive what is happening in our world. But it's our individuals that need that strength as well. But if we could just come together as a church and support one another, and to grow in you, Lord. You are here to help us through all of these things. Folks, I don't know whoever's here in this room and whoever is watching online, understand this. What we're talking today about is a God that loves you. And he wants you to experience him. And salvation is not a mystery. It's simply saying, Lord, I want you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and be the Lord and Savior of my life. <laughs> the thief on the cross said two words, remember me. And Jesus looked back at him and said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Lord, it is not about our discouragement and our grief and everything that we go through. It's about your joy. It's about the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And Lord, we have to admit that we have weakness in order to be saved, in order to allow ourselves. If anybody in this room does not know you, that that could be a quick decision and we begin to live our lives for you. If anyone out there watching this online, same thing. So we just thank you for your word today. Continue to energize us and give us, Lord, encouragement as we walk out of these doors. Do not be weighed down by the world's adversity and everything it will throw at us, but be lifted up by your spirit, we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Go in strength.